today on Main Street Living. They had a reason to think Jesus was somebody. They had a reason to begin to wonder if maybe he was the Messiah, the one chosen by God to deliver his people Israel. And if Jesus was all that, he was a major threat to the status quo. The worship service will begin after our opening hymn. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for Palm Sunday is taken from the book of Deuteronomy the 32nd chapter. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free. Then he will say, Where are the God, their gods, the rock in which they took refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering? Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Our epistle lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, the second chapter. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 19th chapter. And when Jesus had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where, an, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat, set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian, word, our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today's message is the epistle lesson, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Dear friends in Christ, we can practically pinpoint the day. It was early spring, 30 A.D., on an early Sunday morning, and Jesus and his disciples set out to travel the, the three or so miles that separate Bethany, where they have been staying, from Jerusalem. They are on their way to the holy city, to the temple, so they can prepare to celebrate the Passover together. It is a festive day. The mood of the crowd that travels with Jesus is indeed celebratory. They have a lot to celebrate, too. Bethany is the hometown of Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, close friends of Jesus and his disciples. Their home had become home base wherever, whenever Jesus and company traveled to Jerusalem, especially during these days. After all, they couldn't stay in Jerusalem. The powers that be in Jerusalem didn't want anything to do with Jesus or his disciples. The leadership there wanted to stamp out any kind of claim that Jesus was somebody, that he had any kind of position amongst the people. And that was not going to be an easy task for them to accomplish either. Word had made it to Jerusalem, to the halls of the power at the temple. Lazarus had been dead, four days dead and in the tomb. And Jesus had raised him from the dead. He had brought him back to life and restored him to his family. The people knew. They had a reason to think Jesus was somebody. They had a reason to begin to wonder if maybe he was the Messiah, the one chosen by God to deliver his people Israel. And if Jesus was all that, he was a major threat to the status quo. So the mood in Jerusalem was far from hospitable towards Jesus and his followers. This wasn't the first miracle Jesus had done. There were numerous ones before this. People healed, lame who could walk, mute who could talk. There were blind people given sight and, and deaf people who now hear. Lepers were cleansed, demons were cast out. People were fed. The forces of nature obeyed Jesus' command. There were these little glimpses given to the people of Jesus, little glimpses of just how great he is. But that's all they were, little glimpses. Nothing overt, nothing over the top, just little hints. Things Jesus does that no ordinary man could possibly do. That is the way it had been his whole life. From the moment of his miraculous conception in the womb of his virgin mother, there was little hints that told the people around Jesus he is no ordinary man. He looked ordinary enough, but there was something, something different. At his birth, born in such a humiliating way, no soft crib to lie in or, or soft clothes to be wrapped up in, just a straw or hay in a manger, a feed trough, strips of rough homespun cloths to swaddle him in. No great palace for him who was born king of the Jews, but a humble home in a nowhere place called Bethlehem. But there were angels who announced his birth to humble shepherds that night. And later there was a star that led the magi to him. He was forced to flee from the people who were in power. He and his family fled to Egypt just to avoid premature death. And then they made their, their way back to where they made their home in a backwater region of Galilee, in a hick town called Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus grew up in a carpenter's home. Doubtful there was any kind of large wealth in this home, just poor Jewish peasants working to pay the taxes, keep food on the table, a roof over their heads, clothes on their back. And there he hides in plain sight, God incarnate in human flesh. Nothing really to look at, an, an ordinary Jewish man growing up on the outskirts of civilization, the one who comes 
not to be served, but to serve. But in that service to mankind, there were still these hints. There is more to Jesus than meets the eyes. Throughout his life, people could never quite figure out who he is. When he spoke, they would marvel at the authority of his words, the the wisdom and power that flowed from his mouth. It always seemed to leave them asking, who is this that speaks with such authority? Even when they seemed to have it all figured out, they still didn't. Peter, when Jesus asked him who he said they was, Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But he had no idea what that meant. And when Jesus began to tell him what it means to be the Christ, that he must suffer and die and rise again, Peter would have none of it. He and his fellow disciples, they still could not put the pieces of this puzzle together. But now as they make their way to Jerusalem on this glorious Sunday morning, now they think they have it. They think they understand. Jesus is the promised descendant of David. He is the one who will rule on David's throne forever. This is the Messiah. This is the anointed one. He is the fulfillment of the prophecies of Scripture. I mean, he can bring the dead back to life. Think what he can do against the hated Roman government. And while they have a little figured out, they still don't understand. They give him a king's parade. But even that is only a glimpse of who he is and why he comes. They confess with their lips that Jesus is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. He is the one who will bring peace. But do they really understand what kind of peace this humble king brings? He is not riding a war horse, a white stallion. Rather, he rides on a humble donkey, a foal that has never been ridden before. These disciples, these followers of Jesus, they bend their knees as they bow before him and lay their clothes in the path of this humble donkey upon which he sits. They wave their palm branches and lay them down as well so so the feet of that little donkey never touch bare ground. All the way down the side of the mountain, across the Kidron Valley, and, and up the other side and into Jerusalem. A glimpse of his glory but only for a brief moment. For this king does not come in worldly power. Instead, he comes in humility, having laid aside his glory, glory as the only son of the Father, full of grace and truth. He comes to serve. He comes in the form of man to serve man. In just a few short days, the cries that welcomed the king will be replaced with cries to crucify him. Those enemies of his, they will have their way. They will see to it that he has hung on the tree of the cross. Ah, but first there will be the beatings, the mockery of a trial. His enemies will see to it that he is convicted of crimes he never committed. They will cry for his blood, and they will get his blood. We will get his blood. (laughs) Because on our own, we are indeed his enemies. This is how he comes to serve. He humbles himself. He becomes obedient to the very point of death. And it is the most cruel deaths he must suffer. He goes to the cross for us, his enemies. We, you and I, we are the ones who cry for his blood. It is our sins, our rebellion against God. This is why he goes to the cross. He didn't have to die for himself, but we sure need him to die for us. This is why he comes to Jerusalem. He comes as a servant, a slave to mankind. He comes to offer up his perfect life, a life lived without sin from the the moment of his miraculous conception to to his violent and bloody death. He offers up his life as payment for our sins. He offers his back to the whips, his head to take the crown of thorns. He, He humbles himself, yet it is in his humility that we see his glory. 
It is as he hangs on a cross, carrying the weight of our sins on his beaten and bloodied body, that we witness what it means for God to take on human flesh. Here we see why he comes. The king comes to die. He comes to die so he can save you and me. He comes to bring peace, real peace, lasting peace. He comes to bring peace between God and man. Even now, it seems we still only get glimpses of the glory of Jesus, the the Son of God, our Savior, but those glimpses are enough for us to know. He is who He says He is. He comes in humility and meets us where He has called us to gather. He, He speaks through His servant, the pastor, and and pronounces sins forgiven. He comes in the midst of suffering and pain and promises that He is with us. He will never forsake us. Jesus comes and meets us in humble places like our homes as we read His word of truth and grace and teach it to our children and family. Through this word, He continues to send His Holy Spirit, working faith in the hearts of those who were formerly His enemies, making it possible for those tongues to now confess with us that Jesus is Lord. The King comes and meets us in our illnesses. He is still healing and restoring us. He is still comforting us with His humble yet powerful and glorious presence. He still opens our eyes and ears so we can see and we can hear His voice and and hear His name in our hour of deepest need. In those glimpses of glory we see, Jesus is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. In fact, His name is above all names. He rides into Jerusalem for one purpose and one purpose only, to defeat our enemies, to defeat the sin that corrupts us, to defeat Satan who seeks our destruction, and to defeat death that waits for us. Also, He can give us life. His life. We gather today and rejoice. Our knees bow before Him and our tongues confess together, Jesus is Lord. He is our Savior. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and always. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be partakers of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray the prayer Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.
Thank you for viewing Main Street Living this morning. I'm Reverend Scott Seiler, the president of the South Dakota District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and one of the preachers on this program. Main Street Living has been on the air since January 6, 2002, thanks to God directing and blessing this program. For these many years, it has been our mission to help you to know and trust the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is free to us, but it costs Jesus his very life. Sometimes we use the word grace as an acronym to express this good news. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, willingly given by our triune God because He loves you so much. Today you have heard good news like this on our program. Thank you for tuning in today to Main Street Living. We ask that you pray for God's continued blessing upon this program and please consider giving a gift to support this ministry and keep it on the air so that many others may know God's saving grace for them. You may send your gift to this address, Main Street Living, 1400 South Duluth Avenue, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57105. Tune in again next week to Main Street Living. And until then, remember that God loves you so very much and that His grace God's riches at Christ's expense is something you can count on every day of your life.